Let it rip. Dust ring. It too shall fall. Holy sh Emanator? I barely know her. I wrote the script with my hands, but the little head did all the thinking. I will be overhyping Acheron egregiously. Take nothing I say seriously. Acheron's an absolute unit following the nihility path that you should only pull if you no longer wish to have fun in the game, because she does way too much goddamn damage. You could argue she's an erudition unit at heart, but nihility makes the most sense no matter which way you look, because if you slot her in your party, nothing else matters. Except for your other nihility units. The only thing with more girth than her damage is the amount of text in this Yu-Gi-Oh card level description. I'm going to be consolidating a lot of this information, because I don't want to hear me talk for an hour, and neither do you. Her ultimate has top priority for leveling, followed by her skill and talent. Her basic attack is... basic. Try not to use it. Other than that, all of her traces contribute to manslaughter, so they're all worth the investment. When an enemy receives a debuff, whether it's from your unit's skill, a weakness break, or an enemy ability, Akron receives one slashed dream. Just like I did when I lost my 50-50. And my 75-25. Uh, I f At the same time, the enemy receiving the debuff gets a stack of Crimson Knot, which is, kind of ironically, not Crimson. If multiple enemies are getting debuffed, the stack goes on the enemy holding the most knots, but there will only be one. If you're hitting one enemy with multiple debuffs, you still only get one knot. Acheron's skill is a blast attack, and also inflicts the primary target with a Crimson Knot stack, while Acheron receives a stack of Slashed Dream. You also get five of these each upon entering battle. In general, it's one knot per debuffing action. If enemies with Crimson Knot die, the next enemy with the most knots gets knotted some more. These knots do not knot as waves of enemies fall so the only way to use them is through Acheron's ultimate. At 9 stacks of slash streams, Acheron can pop Acher off. The ultimate has 3 attacks requiring user input and a 4th slash that activates on its own. The initial 3 slashes can remove up to 3 Crimson Knots each, and each knot removed grants additional damage. Auto Battle seems to prioritize enemies properly as well as rip the ultimate faster, but if you wanted to tear off someone's head and sh** down his throat yourself, you should always aim for an enemy with at least 3 knots on them. If you're in an awkward spot where you have three knots across multiple enemies, target the enemy with the most knots. If an enemy dies before the ultimate is finished, whatever knots they had get moved over to the enemy with the next highest knot number. Any knots not nutted get consumed by the ultimate's climax, but for no additional damage, so use them before you lose them. And if that wasn't enough, her Thundercore Trace just gives you more damage for knotting knotted enemies. Also, her talent reduces all type resistances by about 20% during her ultimate, and in the spirit of Nihility, doesn't give a damn about weakness types. You're gonna break one way or another. The maximum number of knots you can have on the field is 9. Your maximum stacks of slash streams is 9. Our favorite Nihility Eon is 9. My girlfriend is 9. If enemies happen to get debuffed above 9, you get a stack of Quadrivalent Ascendance. Quadrivalent Ascendance acts as a kind of overflow and caps at 3. When you use your ultimate, after all Crimson Knots get eaten, Quadrivalent Ascendance gets converted to slash streams for you and Crimson Knots for them, giving you a kind of head start on your upcoming war crimes. This prevents you from capping on your Shattered Dreams while also allowing you to hold your ultimate with virtually no consequences to capitalize on buff or debuff timings. In Razor language, enemy get debuff, enemy and Acheron get stack. Acheron have 9 stacks, Acheron alt, Acheron eat 3 stacks per slash, Acheron nihilit pose on their graves. Due to her weird stacking mechanic, energy regeneration doesn't help. Energy restoration doesn't help. The hunt card that restores energy does not work. However, Brain and Evad on Erudition cards seems to function okay. You can't even do any cheeky positioning tricks like sandwiching Acheron between two higher enmity units to get her hit more often. An Acheron Macaron, if you will. If you stuff your Nihility units full of cocaine speed, you can build her stacks faster. However, there is actually another way to build pseudo-energy restoration on her. Just buy it. Her signature light cone, along the passing shore, is surely passing everyone's expectations. While the stats it gives are pretty bonkers for her, the real value comes in the form of the Mirage Fizzle debuff. The 48% increased damage to your ultimate is nice, but the neat part is it counts as a debuff, while Crimson Knot does not. Acheron's skill adds a Crimson Knot as per the skill effect. Then her Light Cone, on hit, adds the Mirage Fizzle debuff. This does so with zero consent, by the way. Your effect hit rate and their effect resistance does not matter. So, with your Crimson Knot added by skill effect and a debuff applied by Light Cone, you actually get two knots from one action. Depending on your team compositions, speeds, enemies you're fighting, light cones, and maybe some RNG, in 5 cycles, you can go from around 37 knots at E0-S0 to 44 knots with her S1. That's almost another full ultimate. If that's not enough ER for you, go for her E2, where under the same conditions, you can squeeze out around 51 knots instead. At this point, we're averaging over 1 ultimate per cycle. Also, I'm kidding. Spend responsibly. Nothing in this game requires that much violence. Except for Sampo. On a more serious note, let's talk about her team options. One of her major traces gives her more damage depending on the number of additional Nihility units you run with her. 
one additional unit nets you a 115% multiplier, and another one bumps you up to 160%. Misery truly loves company. This multiplier is bigger than you'd think. In a lot of cases, additional damage multipliers get lumped into one bonus damage product. These are things like elemental damage on your sphere and the damage buff on Branya's skill. The Abyss passive is a separate multiplier, which means it doesn't get saturated by other multipliers of its kind, yet. And that basically means you don't hit diminishing returns on it. A very scary term. So, starting with Nihility units, we have Sampo and Luka, neither of which I find particularly synergistic. Luka can inflict a bleed on his skill, but if we're looking for consistency, there are better options. Sampo can help in enabling the Fermata Light Cone, but his strengths are best left to dot teams. Then we have Gwen Ifen, who can apply burns from her skill and has an 80% base chance to burn on her basic attack. She's an overall solid choice. One thing to note is Gwen Ifen's Fire Kiss debuff that's applied after her burn ticks does not actually add stacks for Akron, but the burn tick that's activated by her ultimate does, for reasons. Also, she's cute. Moving up the Nihility tree, we have Kafka and Black Swan hand in hand. This is a top tier waifu team, but honestly, where the f*** do you get your skill points from? I'm sure you can get this to work, but I have neither of them to try, and I feel like it may be better to run a unit that either plays more to your dot damage, or more to Acheron's strengths. Besides, this is probably a canonically awkward team. Black Swan? More like Blacked Swan. Though, it is worth noting that Black Swan's Arcana debuff is automatically applied to enemies when they enter battle, and I believe this contributes towards Acheron's knots if they are spawned in by an enemy's ability. You do not get additional knots when enemies from the next wave enter. Next, we have Pela and Silverwolf, both of which are great options. Silverwolf's utility is slightly diminished by Akron's ability to ignore enemy weakness types during her ultimate, but Silverwolf can consistently plant debuffs and shred enemy defense by a lot on a good cycle time all while being skill point positive. Pela can do the same thing, but in AoE. However, to rival Silverwolf's debuffing ability, she should be holding the Resolution Shines as Pearls of Sweat Light Cone for consistent ensnares. Note that you can't ensnare an already snared enemy. Our last Nihility unit is an interesting one. Welt's damaging utility is present, but alternatives tend to be stronger, and his personal damage isn't on par with the likes of Swan or Kafka, but he opens up an interesting way to play. Between the slows on his skill and the imprisons on his ultimate, enemies will often struggle to keep up with your afterimage. If enemies are weak to imaginary, he can pair particularly well with Grunmei for extended break periods. With proper timing, you may even be able to drop your sustain unit entirely. Doing so allows you to run two Nihility units for the Abyss passive and faster Akron ultimate cycling, and a Harmony unit for even more damage. Your damage will be pretty high, and the enemy will be painfully slow, allowing you to acaroni and cheese your way through mechanics and even some entire boss phases. Needless to say, but I'll say it anyway, this is not necessarily an easy team to play. No sustain means no healing or shielding, so if enemies are fast and you don't have anything to keep them at bay, you may find your fate in the hands of RNG. Where there's good, there must be bad. Where there is yin, there must also be yang. But it is fun, and not running a sustain unit means you can experience some crazy new damage ceilings. Let's get back to something more grounded. Your first slot is obviously Acheron, then you generally have two Nihility units, and the last slot is typically a sustain. Most sustains will get you by, but a few of the noteworthy ones are Jepard and Fire Trailblazer. Jepard's skill can freeze, which counts as a debuff, but possibly more importantly, both of them can hold the trend of the Universal Market Light Cone, which inflicts a fire debuff when they're attacked. This synergizes particularly well with Jepard's overwhelming desire to be punched in the face, and Fire Trailblazer's hard taunt ability, another debuff. To the same effect, March 7th can also work, but you may find that single target shielding puts you on the struggle bus. Fushun is also a great option due to her team-wide crowd control resistance, mitigation consistency, and SP positivity to counterbalance all that nihilism. If none of those options are fit for you, maybe you pulled a few copies of Gallagher on Acheron's banner. Even if you didn't, there's an event running with a 4-star selector where I will happily grab his ass. He's a healer that's not particularly reliant on stat scalings, making him a pretty good option for lower investment, and he can apply debuffs through his ultimate and enhanced basic attack. Now, you may feel running two additional Nihility units and a sustain is restrictive when it comes to team building. And it is. But it doesn't always have to be. Acheron's arguably best E0 team for general purpose use is Pella, Silverwolf, and your favorite sustain, as long as that sustain is Fushen. Between Pela and Silverwolf, you cap out on defense shredding, and replacing either of them feels bad and is just numerically worse. But maybe you skipped out on Silverwolf's banner, or Pella is playing hard to get. Most other Nihility units can be replaced by Bronya or Sparkle, and between their buffs and their action advanced mechanics, you can actually squeeze out more damage despite losing part of your The Abyss passive. Because Acheron generates knots on her skill, you usually want to build her with speed boots. Using fast Bronya or fast Sparkle means you can skip the speed boots for attack boots instead. While this composition will generate you fewer knots, your ultimates will hit harder. Ranmei is also a decent option, though I find her generally weaker than the previous two unless you're synergizing with Welt. Other harmony options we have available tend to be much weaker unless you have Akron's E2. 
Asta can burn enemies, has a speed buff, and a much appreciated attack buff, but losing out on your The Abyss passive hurts too much. The same goes for Hanya, Yukong, and especially Tingyin, since half the reason you use her is for the energy restoration that won't work for Akron's ultimate, but at least the other half lets you hit harder. On the topic of hitting harder, let's talk light cones. Most of them kinda suck. Eyes of the Prey and before the tutorial mission starts are off the table for obvious reasons, and Resolution Shines as Pearls of Sweat can debuff, but really should be held by another unit instead. Your only decent 4-star options at the moment are It's Showtime, We Will Meet Again, and Good Night and Sleep Well. Showtime's buff uptime isn't very good, and you'll basically never see that attack buff, but the damage buff will at least catch Akron's ultimate, which does inflict a resistance down debuff. Hitting 3 targets or more will get you full stacks, but dropping to 2 or fewer hurts its performance. The Nameless Honor Light Cone, We Will Meet Again, has comparable performance, but I wouldn't buy a battle pass specifically for that, especially when Showtime is free-to-play accessible. I'd much rather shred my wallet to lose on the Light Cone banner instead. Good Night and Sleep Well is the best 4-star option. For now but even at S5, it's over 25% behind her signature in a standard Acheron team. The last option I think might be worth looking at is Fermata. It's largely not that synergistic, but if you're one of those Kafka Swanaron chads, it's not a bad idea. Moving over to 5-star options, Incessant Rain is pretty decent, even if the effect hit rate buff on it is somewhat wasted. Running 2 Nihility units means you'll often have the crit rate passive active, and that extra 12% damage is a nice little bonus, but the real nice thing is implanting that Aether Code, which will contribute towards Acheron slash Dream and Crimson Knot stacks. In the Name of the World is also an option, but if you don't have it already, it's not really worth using your Undying Starlight on. 600 Undying Starlight is 30 pulls that can be used towards your Light Cone, and even if you miss, maybe you pick up a good night and sleep well along the way. Patience is all you need as a thing, with the Erode effect on it being a debuff, but if a target is already eroded, they can't be reroded, which essentially makes this a less effective incessant rain. Reforged Remembrance is for dot damage and should be on Black Swan anyway, and Solitary Healing ain't it either. Finally, for you Welt enthusiasts, you can use Loop. It's a bit of a cope option, but if you have literally nothing else, you probably have at least this. It's important to note that loop is actually pretty strong if you're willing to forsake your sustain and run a unit like Bronya or Sparkle with attack boots over speed, but it does require Welt to enable it consistently. It's also important to note that most teams get significantly stronger when you forsake your sustain option and run a unit like Bronya or Sparkle with attack boots over speed. Either way, good luck not getting dogpiled. Moving on to her signature. Holy sh**. I already talked about what it does, but to contextualize it, in a 5 cycle battle, it's about a 26% increase over an S5 good night and sleep well. That's it. It's really good. If you had to choose between getting the light cone or an Adeline or two, grab the light cone. But don't feel obligated to pull if you don't want to. Acheron is a perfectly good unit without it. And while all the other light cone options sound a little cope, because they kind of are, give it some time. I'm sure Mihoya will have a free event light cone coming up in the near or distant future that will play to Acheron's strengths. Surely. Now, everyone's favorite, Relics. Pioneer Diver of Dead Waters is the way to play, everything else is quite a bit behind. Planar ornaments are slightly more ambiguous. Izumo Gensei and Takuma Divine Realm is generally on top, but Space Sealing Station and Inert Sal Soto are 3-4% behind, meaning if you have a few good pieces that are 2-3 crit subsets ahead, they could be the better option for you. Moving up to Giga Simp levels of investment, Sal Soto and Izumo are basically the same at E6. Regarding stat choices, speed to taste, crit rate and crit damage trying to maintain a healthy balance, then attack last. I personally aim for around 134 speed when I'm running two nihility units and a sustain unit, but if I opt for Bronya or Sparkle, I drop speed boots for attack instead. That being said, body should be crit rate or crit damage depending on how well you can round your stats out. I'd try to aim for 80% crit rate and around 160% crit damage to start. Your rope should be attack cause, well, it can't be energy restoration. Sphere should also be attack, but if you want to go lightning, it's anywhere from 1-4% to behind, depending on your configurations. If you got better subsets on a lightning ball, go with that one instead. On to the Eidolons. E1 is crit rate. We love crit rate. It's about a 13% bump over E0. E2 is monstrous. It allows you to run one additional nihility unit instead of two to complete your The Abyss passive for the full 160%. You may be thinking, well if I drop a nihility unit, my debuffs don't stack as quickly. And you're right. But no. Because when Acheron's turn starts, she just gains a slash dream and the enemy with the most crimson knots gets knotted again. With this, you have the option to run a harmony unit for a huge damage boost. Bronya will offer the highest output, but Sparkle's SP positivity makes almost any team composition you want to run very comfortable to play. That's not to say you can't continue to run your Nihility gang though. Your knot generation is crazy if you choose to keep your Nihila 3 squad. If you find you're out of juice, E2 is a good stopping point. E3 is plus 2 to ultimate and basic attack and yields about 5% more damage. E4 gives enemies an 8% vulnerability to ultimates when they enter the field, and while this is technically a debuff, it doesn't always give you a knot. 
If you start a battle and there is no technique that gives you some kind of priority move, the vulnerability debuff does not add a stack. If there is, like Fushen's or Run Mei's techniques, it will. When a new enemy spawns upon clearing the previous wave, no not. When enemies are spawned in by the effects of other enemies like Yen Cheng and his swords or a Sanctus Medicus Disciple and his Mara Struck soldiers, you get a knot. When an enemy spawns itself in like a Warp Trotter, no not again. Confused yet? Me too. This one's a little hard to quantify because I don't know exactly how I should simulate new enemies spawning in. If you assume it never happens, it's at least a 6-7% increase over E3. E5 is a plus 2 to talent and skill, which is a paltry 3% bump over E4, and E6 is crazy, being about 40% thicker than E5 and over twice as strong as E0. Now it's time for the good, the bad, and the me. The good. She does a lot of damage. Even if you're not willing to shell out for Eidolons and her light cone, her output is pretty strong. She's fun to play. She has great animations and her ultimate feels really flexible. There are often cases where I'm playing another unit knowing full well it's better to save an ultimate for the right moment, but doing so will overcap my energy and it feels like doo-doo butter. With Acheron, you can rip your ultimate at 9 stacks or wait for up to 3 more stacks before any resources get wasted, and it's just a pleasant feeling. Her technique is also a great time saver, allowing you to insta-clap low-tier enemies in the world when you just want to get from point A to point Nihila B. You can tell which enemies will crumble beneath your girth when you see this red icon over their heads. Also, it looks really cool. Get your trick snacks ready. As for the bad, she does a lot of damage. You'll get bored of the game and your reason to exist dissipates into nothingness. On a serious note, it's time for some post-not clarity. While her damage is good, vertical investment really shines with her. The amount of damage you gain by wailing is wild, especially because she currently lacks synergistic light cone options and that can be a pretty bad feeling if you're susceptible to that kind of thing. The easy fix? Don't be. Gameplay-wise, I don't really have anything to complain about aside from the restrictive feeling of playing around her the Abyss passive, but that might be a me problem. And then the ugly. Nope, still just me here. So, if you've pulled for Acheron, congratulations, I hope you're enjoying her. If you're still pulling for Acheron, good luck, I hope you can enjoy her soon. In either case, just remember, if you're not as crimson, you should consult a physician. And a big thank you to my channel members. Member. Yeehaw, look at all this space you get. Yeah, <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs>